welcome to Format 360. I'm your host, Jeremy Shea. Today we're discussing how tumbling oil prices affect everything in Alaska. Oil is at the heart of Alaska's economy, and the price per barrel a leading indicator of its health. So what happens now with the price at about half of what it was expected to be? Our guest today will explain and tell us what we might be able to do about it. Gunnar Knapp is an economics professor at the University of Alaska Anchorage. He also directs the university's Institute for Social and Economic Research. And Cliff Groh is the chairman of the nonpartisan public policy organization, Alaska Common Ground. He's a writer, lawyer, and finance expert who's worked in the Department of Revenue and the Alaska Legislature. Thanks for joining us on Forum at 360. Uh, you guys have brought along some presentations, but before we get into those, I thought I'd ask you, why should the average Alaskan care? Gunnar? The uh, state is drastically short of money compared to what it's been in the past few years, and um, it's going to cause some major changes in, uh, in the way we run our state's finances. And um, this is going to be central to uh, this legislative session and, and um, probably the ones that follow. And uh, 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 if you care about the services you receive from state government or, or your dividend or whether you pay taxes, all of these things are going to be talked about and discussed and um, big changes could happen. And so you want to be informed and, and pay attention and, and advocate for what matters to you. And what you think is best for Alaska. And Cliff, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, Alaska faces very difficult choices about uh, its future, and those choices will necessarily change some or all of the current fiscal system that Alaska has, which um, is unsustainable. And so Alaskans need to, like Gunnar suggested, think carefully about what those choices are and whether they make which ones make the most sense for Alaska and how they would affect different Alaskans and as in this critical time uh, that's being uh, forced upon us by the slump in oil prices or crash in oil prices uh, which is both exposed and exacerbated uh, pre-existing structural problems in, in Alaska's uh, fiscal system. And you guys have done a couple of these talks around uh, Anchorage and a couple more talks this week in, in Juneau. What do you hope to accomplish by, by doing this? Two things. One, we're simply trying to inform people about the basic facts of the situation. What, what is actually happening to our revenues, our spending, uh, our savings, uh, and so on. That's what uh, I've been doing in my part of these talks, simply just to try to explain the basic facts. And Cliff is... Um, Gunner has a lot of numbers and very pretty graphs. Um, I, on the other hand, um, offer questions. I set out the uh, options for uh, dealing um, with this, the state's uh, fiscal challenge, and then I ask questions to help people think about um, which options um, are the more valuable or viable for Alaskans. Okay, we've got a short video that an Alaska Common Ground member created. It lays out the situation in kind of broad strokes. Let's take a look at that. Consider this. The state of Alaska spends more per capita than any other state government in the country like two to six times more. We've got a fatter bank account, more resources, more land than any other state. And unlike those other guys, we don't pay a dime for it. No state income tax, no property tax, sales tax. We even get a dividend. It's a pretty sweet ride in the gravy train. But where does all that money come from? Well, a bit over half of all of our revenue comes from the feds, earnings of the permanent fund, and other sources that can only be used for certain things. Meanwhile, the vast majority of our unrestricted revenue comes from oil. And while increasing prices over the last several years have allowed us to cover our bills, the amount of oil we produce is going down. Unless we find a new Pluto Bay, which isn't likely, that isn't going to change. So at some point in the not too distant future, we'll have blown through our savings, be spending more than we make, and that's where we're going to need to make some real tough decisions. Where do we cut spending? Do we spend the permanent fund? Do we tax ourselves? Not to be overly dramatic about it, but it's a pretty big deal. So that's a good overview for what Gunnar Knapp is going to go into in, in more depth. Gunnar. Hi, folks. So uh, my name is Gunnar Knapp, and I am uh, director of the Institute of Social and Economic Research, or ICER, uh, uh, up at UAA. And um, what I want to try to do is take you on a quick tour through state savings revenues and spending. 
Um, now, my goal in this presentation is to help Alaskans understand the facts of this situation. Um, I'm not trying to say what we should do. I'm just trying to help you understand the basic numbers. Um, I'd emphasize that this is a complicated topic. Uh, in this, I've, I've tried to simplify it uh, in order to get through in a very short time uh, some uh, uh, the big picture of, and there's um, uh, you know there's just a lot more that could be said, and I don't have time to say it all here. So there's a lot of details that I'm not going to get into. Um, uh, some quick terminology to start. Uh, when we're talking about state spending and revenues in different years, we're talking about fiscal years. That's how they measure it. And the fiscal year starts on July 1st and ends on uh, June 30th. And uh, right now we're in fiscal year 15, and fiscal year 15 started six months ago and will end six, six months from now. And uh, the uh, legislature wrote the budget for fiscal year 15 last year. Uh, last year's legislative session, but we don't yet actually know how much money we're going to have because we're in the middle of it and the oil prices are changing and so on. And we don't actually know what we're um, going to spend because we might, we might adjust that budget. The legislature this year is working on the budget for FY16 that we're going into. Um, now, when, <clears throat> like this little video said, when you talk about revenues, uh, you can talk about unrestricted revenues and restricted revenues. And unrestricted revenues are revenues we can use any way we want. And uh, um, restricted revenues, uh, we have a, a variety of those. Those are revenues that are restricted either by law or, in some cases, by custom. And most of the conversation is about unrestricted revenues because those are what pay for our, uh, most of our government. Um, the state has many different funds. Uh, the general fund is the fund that uh, we use to pay uh, for most of state government. And we have all these other, other kinds of funds, of which the most famous is the permanent fund, that um, you know, have uh, varying amounts of money in them and that are, are used for various special purposes. And so most of this presentation and most of what I'm going to be talking about and most of what the debate is about um, that, that you'll be hearing is about the unrestricted general fund. Where do we get the revenues that go into that and how do we use it? So a quick overview of our fiscal situation. Since the start of the fiscal year, uh, oil prices have fallen unexpectedly and dramatically by more than half. Nobody saw a fall in prices coming of, of this magnitude, and we still don't know uh, how much farther oil prices might fall. Um, and uh, we might note that as of last uh, spring, when the legislature wrote the budget, they were, uh, they were working on the assumption that the Department of Revenue had projected that oil prices this year would average $105, basically what, you know, what they'd been the past few years. And um, they rev in December, they revised those projections that, um, to say that, well, over the course of the year, given that they started high, and now they're down you know, around $50, well, they'll average uh, around $76 for the year. That might or might not come true. They could average lower than uh, 76. Or if the oil prices go back up, they could average higher. Here is our fiscal situation this year. Um, we are budgeted to spend $5.9 billion, or $8,000 per Alaskan. Uh, but at the uh, current projected prices, our projected revenues will be only $2.6 billion. Um, and, um, or, and as a result, we are facing a deficit of $3.4 billion, or 57% of our total budget is a deficit. And that deficit works out to $4,500 per Alaskan in money that, that we're not earning this year um, compared to what we're spending. How did we get into this situation? So I want to take you on a quick tour looking backward and then looking ahead. And um, so these graphs go from 2006 up to 2014. And the red line there shows what our actual revenues uh, were. And you can see that um, our revenues, I'm going to have to look back here so I can read my own graphs. Um, our revenues were rising um, uh, and high and growing from 2005 to 2012. So we're in this period of very rapidly rising state revenues. 
And during that time, um, as our revenues grew, so did our spending. However, um, we were, uh, until 2012, our revenues exceeded our spending, so we were running big surpluses. And we were saving those surpluses in um, several savings funds. <clears throat> but then as the uh, prices, as our revenues began to fall, we began to run deficits. And even though you can see we started to cut spending, uh, we weren't cutting as uh, rapidly as our revenues, so we were incurring uh, deficits despite cutting spending. Now, this is the situation last spring. The legislature uh, had uh, revenue projections that we, um, uh, uh, that are shown by the, uh, you know, the line there of what the projected revenues were, and they said, well, boy, we can't cut all the way down to the level, so they, they budgeted for um, uh, a $1.3 billion deficit based uh, even last year with the revenues they were projecting last spring. But then <coughs> the uh, expect projected <coughs> revenues fell um, dramatically because of this fall in the oil price, and so that's why we are now looking at this $3.3 billion deficit. Now, if you look over on this graph, you can see that, the, um, that they're projecting that the revenues will be even lower next fiscal year. So they're looking at even less money next fiscal year. That's the budget that the legislature is working on um, this session. But then that they're projecting that the revenues will rise back up kind of what the, to what they were projecting earlier. But even if the revenues rise up to the projected level, um, if we continued to spend at this year's spending level, we would still be running big deficits. Now we've got, um, at, as of the start of this fiscal year, we had savings of $12.2 billion in um, what, are, what are the easily accessible savings funds that were available to pay for deficits, but we're running a $3.4 billion deficit uh, projected, and if, if we take in the revenues that the uh, Department of Revenue is projecting going forward, then if we continue to spend at this year's spending levels, we'd continue to run deficits, and we would drain down those um, savings in seven years. But if we don't get revenues as high as are projected, then if we continued to spend at this level, our deficits would be bigger. And we would drain down our savings in a shorter period of time. And you can look at, at uh, sort of worst case scenarios about what might happen with oil prices and revenues, and we could drain through those savings in three or four years. That's a bad scenario. Or maybe it could be better if the revenues were higher than projected. Okay, now I want to take a more detailed look at state revenues. What explains um, why our revenues fell so precipitously? <clears throat> well, we are in this state hugely dependent on oil. Um, in this graph, the red shows oil revenues and the blue shows all our other unrestricted general fund revenues. And oil revenues have paid for about have represented 90% in recent years of our unrestricted general fund revenues. <clears throat> and um, you can see, if you look at the history of our oil revenues, they have fluctuated dramatically uh, from year to year and over longer periods of time. And then we had this huge run-up in revenues in the 2000s, um, uh, you know, 2006 to 2012, and now this precipitous fall, a $6.9 billion drop in our revenues since 2012. So why? What's been going on? Well, <coughs> our revenues on the bottom here are basically, they have varied with the value of North Slope oil pr uh, production. And um, so what drives the value of North Slope oil production? Well, one thing is, the volume of production. And uh, you know, so the value is tied, tied to how much you produce. And it's important for Alaskans to understand that our oil production has been declining. If you've been around here for a long time, you're used to thinking of Alaska as a major oil producing state. Uh, but we were a lot more major oil producing uh, 25 years ago at our production peak when our oil production was almost four times as high as it now is. So our production has declined, and that is one, one reason why um, our, production, our um, 
the decline in recent years is one of the things that's contributed to the um, drop in revenues. The other thing, of course, that's affected our revenues is the price of oil. And we benefited from this enormous rise in the price of oil uh, from 2005 to 2012, and we are now suffering the consequences of this dramatic fall in prices um, that's happened recently. To understand how that change in value translates into oil revenues, you have to look at the different kinds of oil revenues. And the two most important kinds are royalties, which are in blue in the graph, and production taxes, which are in red in the graph. These are calculated in different ways. The royalties are contractual payments that the producers make to us under a contract um, that, you know, that we agreed on when they leased the oil. And the, um, and the production taxes are based on whatever production tax law we have, which we've changed several times over the years. Um, if you look at this graph, you can see, well, in, you know, recently both of, since 2012, both of these sources of revenues have gone down. But the big drop has been in the production tax revenues. That's where most of the decline in our values happened. So what's going on? Well, basically royalties, it's a simple, pretty simple calculation. Royalties are basically just a fixed share of the wellhead value, the North Slope value. Usually it's 12.5%. So um, the, well, the re royalties vary proportionally to the value. So they've gone down, you know, um, the wellhead value has fallen 42% since 2012, the royalties fallen 45%, basically proportional. Um, but the production taxes are much, much more complicated. Our production taxes since um, 2007 have been based on producers' profits. We don't tax the, the gross receipts, we tax their profits. And by the way, this is a feature of both ACES and SB21. They both operated exactly the same way in terms of they both taxed profits, which were calculated the same way. So the tax base is the producer's profits, and that reflects both prices and costs. And then there's lots and lots and lots of other very complicated features to the um, production tax laws. Um, and producers can apply credits, and the formulas changed a lot of times, and so on. Way too complicated uh, to get into. <clears throat> but if you look at this graph, which is way too complicated to understand, the green line shows the wellhead value, and the, um, you deduct the amount that uh, the royalty payments, and then you deduct the, perp deduct the purple, which is the cost, and that gets you to the tax base, which is really the profits. Okay, so the production tax ba is, is um, calculated based on this tax base. And the tax base has declined drastically. And um, it has declined both because of falling value, but also rising costs. So it's not just that the price of oil has fallen, it's also the cost of producing the oil has risen so when you get to the actual profits available to tax, it's just, it's just declined dramatically. And then, uh, then finally, you have the production taxes that are paid, which is this red, which are based on a formula, the tax law, which is um, what percentage of that tax base we collect. But the main driving factor in, um, in the decline is just the tax base has declined so drastically. Now, what's going to happen to our revenues in the future? Are they going to rebound after 2016, like the Department of Revenue uh, projects? This is, what did they say, the 69, 60, $69, $69 you know, the, this is sort of like the $6.9 billion question. This is the critical question facing Alaska in terms of our um, short run finances at least. What is actually gonna happen to our revenues? Now, um, these projections of higher revenues are based on this price assumption shown here that the Department of Revenue made about what was, what, what, this is what they project will happen to the price of oil, the average price of oil in future fiscal years. Um, but this is what I would emphasize to all Alaskans. You can't assume that that's gonna come true. This 
is highly uncertain. These are very hard working and smart people at the Department of Revenue, but they, they did not travel into the future in a time machine. This is their best guess. To, if you want to make your own guess, you can sort of try to think about the economics of oil prices, which is very complicated. You can read a lot in the paper and a lot of speculation. Most of the experts think that what's going on is the prices are falling because world oil supply exceeds world oil demand. Uh, we've expanded world oil supply so quickly that, there's that the world is awash in oil and prices are falling and they're going to keep falling until production declines enough um, to, to match how much the world wants to use. And then at that point, experts think, well, the prices will go back up, but then how much they go back up will be sort of, it'll get stopped by when the production picks up so that the you know, um, supply begins to exceed demand. And the problem is it's very difficult to predict how far the oil prices might fall, when they'll rise again, or how far they will rise again. Um, and the, there are plausible arguments that smart people can spin out and are spinning out if you read the press. You can make plausible arguments how over the next few years oil prices could be anywhere between $40 a barrel and $140 a barrel. You, c you can come up with scenarios um, that you know, make reasonable sense and you can argue about which are, which are more likely. But you can't assume the Department of Revenue projections are going to happen. These different lines on this graph show what the Department of Revenue pro projected in previous years about what would be uh, you know, future oil prices and then the, the solid red line shows what actually happened to the oil prices. And you can see they were never able to project ahead. They never could guess the future. And so they still can't guess. Nobody can guess. And that means that our future state revenues could be significantly or lower or higher than those projections. Um, it's interesting to note here is our future and our oil revenues are highly sensitive to the price of oil. But um, you can see that uh, this is the same graph I showed earlier, the 76 barrels, that's what our current projections are for this year. And at different prices, you can see we are still going to have big deficits unless oil gets up over $100 uh, a barrel. Now. Um, I'm going to rush through my last few slides because, uh, you know, sort of time is very limited. Where, what do we spend money on? Well, um, there are three components to the state budget. There's what they call the agency operations that pays for the different departments. Um, there's what they call statewide operations, which pays for things like debt service and, and retirement fund payments that aren't associated with a particular department. And then there's the capital budget. And uh, this graph shows the trend, uh, you know, over the past few years in those different components of the budget. You can see the agency operations budget um, is by far the largest share and it's been going up, 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 up. And there are things that are contributing to that um, such as rising health care costs um, and, um, and many other factors, school foundation formula and so on. And then um, you can see we've also had big capital expenditures and statewide operations. Here are um, the uh, state agency budgets for the top five state agencies. Two agencies, Education and Early Development and Health and Social Services, represent more than half the agency operations budget, okay? And uh, followed by the University of Alaska and corrections and, and transportation. Here is the breakdown for all the different agencies in, in state government about um, you know, what their total budget was in FY14 and how much it's grown, uh, you know, since the blue, which is um, FY06. Okay, the reality is that if you're looking for money in the state budget, there is no way you can get to, you know, the bulk of the money without getting, without getting a significant share out of these largest agencies. Um, I don't really have time to go through the, um, uh, statewide operations budget, so I'll just cl uh, click through there. Basically, um, that includes um, debt service, 
and retirement payments are um, some of the largest parts of it, that things are going to be hard to, hard to get out of in the future. It also includes some credits that we've been paying to um, oil companies. Finally, we have our state savings accounts. Um, we have uh, uh, savings in the Constitutional Budget Reserve Fund and the Statutory Budget Reserve Fund. Those are those $12 billion in savings that we're paying for deficits with. Um, and we also have our very large permanent fund. And, uh, uh, but most of the permanent fund is not available for spending. Only the red part at the top is the so-called earnings reserve. That's the part we pay um, that um, we take uh, the money out to pay for dividends and inflation proofing every year and uh, we get new money to put in from the statutory net income of the permanent fund which is sort of you know um, invest part you know sort of their their investment earnings and um, the statutory net income of the permanent fund has it's highly variable like oil revenues but it's been growing over time as the permanent fund grows and this year it's higher than our oil revenues. How do we use that um, earnings reserve? We've been using it to pay for dividends and um, inflation proofing, which is contribution to the permanent fund. Um, and uh, now, as you know, we are enjoying substantial dividends in our state. And um, dividends are, are significant compared with other kinds of state spending. So finally, I want to leave you with uh, a few simple conclusions of what the conclusions I draw from these numbers. At our current state spending level of $8,000 per Alaskan and the projected revenues that we're going to get mostly from oil, we're facing very large deficits and we could drain our state savings soon. We could drain them by the time today's first graders are eighth graders if you want to think about how soon, or we could drain them much sooner than that. Um, and unless we are very lucky and oil prices rise dramatically and unexpectedly, we cannot continue to spend $8,000 per Alaskan, depend mostly on oil to pay for it, and pay for the rest for, from savings, because we don't have enough savings to go on doing that. So soon, and maybe very soon, we will have to adjust by either spending less, finding new revenues, or some combination. And we face two big choices. How are we going to adjust? And when are we going to adjust? And you know, a lot of people are going to be talking about the how are we going to adjust question. And I just want to uh, let, leave you with thinking about the when are we going to adjust? Because one of the choices, we've got savings. So you could say, well, we don't have to change anything this year. We just spend it down out of our savings. Um, but adjusting sooner hurts sooner. And you might say, well, boy, if the oil prices recover, then you know, um, maybe it wasn't even necessary. But if we adjust later, the longer we delay, that leaves us and our children with lower savings and leaves us and our children with lower investment earnings because our savings are lower. It may discourage private investment because who's going to invest in a place that doesn't have its fiscal house in order? And it may discourage, it may um, damage our credit uh, um, reputation. And it risks a crash adjustment if we're unlucky with oil prices. And with that, I'm done with this <laughs> very rushed attempt to sort of give you the basic facts of the situation. Well, thanks, Gunnar. Uh, if you're just joining us, this is Forum at 360. We've just heard from economist Gunnar Knapp of ICER about the Alaska, state of Alaska's dire budget situation. This is the audience's opportunity now to participate. If you've got questions for Gunnar Knapp, please queue up at our microphone, and we can ask them as we go. And if you're following us online, you can tweet your questions to at 360 North, and I, I'll relay them. So at the local level, I guess one of the things that we often feel first would be state funding cuts at the local level that affect local services. Where, where might we feel the, the impact of this budget crisis at local levels? The size of the amount of money that we have to make up is so, is so staggeringly large that I think people are going to be 
there is no area of um, state spending that is sort of secure. Um, and I think you know the biggest biggest place you might see it is in your you know in your schools. There's already been talk that um, uh, I think the Senate president indicated that they're going to be looking at revenue sharing as a potential uh, thing to cut. Um, I think um, I uh, you know I'm going to I'm going to leave it up to um, you know the politicians to uh, you know sort of spe speculate on that. All I would suggest is that with the pressure that we face financially, just everything that government pays for is going to be looked at. Um, you know, and people are going to be saying, can we afford that? You know, is that our highest priority? Okay. Did you want to jump in, Cliff? Sure. Gunner's really smart, but he can be often gloomy. I'm going to try to look <laughs> on the bright side. Maybe with global warming, we will need to plow the roads less. And so, as, and since there'll be less money to plow the roads, that might work out some. Okay, but really, it's any kind of state service here um, that might be affected. So we're talking school funding. You mentioned state troopers, uh, ferry system, highway maintenance, road maintenance. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I hate to say it. All those, all those things. I think people are going to be looking at and saying, "Can we afford that in that in that same way?" Uh, because when, when more than half your, when more than half your budget, you don't have money for. You're just drawing down your savings. You, you just can't go on that, uh, that long. And yet, on the other hand, it, it's kind of a question that drives you crazy because you say, well, actually, we, we really need those things. We really need the troopers and the ferry and the schools. And, and so it is, um, uh, it is not, uh, I'd suggest, this is not a question with an easy answer. I'm sure Cliff will be talking about that. OK. Well, Cliff, before you get started with your presentation on possible ways to address the situation, can you explain what Alaska Common Ground is and, and what it does? Alaska Common Ground is a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization that has worked for more than 20 years to try to get Alaskans to come together and perhaps reach consensus or common ground on our, the major issues facing our state. Uh, I've been a board member for just about 20 years and, was, and became chair uh, last year. Okay. All right. Well, I'll hand the podium over to you. Thanks, Jeremy. I want to thank 360.North uh, and Jeremy for setting this up, and also Ian Lang, the former board member of Alaska Common Ground, who did that uh, short video that you saw earlier. So, what are the options and most important questions regarding Alaska's fiscal challenge? So, you can probably tell now. I'm not a real economist, although sometimes I play one standing at um, lecterns. I'm actually a lawyer, and I've had the responsibility of, of giving clients uh, a lot of unfortunate news and some uh, lousy options. And one way of thinking of Alaska is we've moved from the last frontier to the land of lousy options. So um, maybe it wouldn't fit quite as well on the, on the uh, license plate, but it's a way to think about us right now. But Let's look at that in the most cheerful way possible. So I want to talk about the options and the most important questions regarding how to think about those options. OK, the basic options are four. And since I'm not an economist, I have much lousier uh, PowerPoint skills than Gunner. So um, he's promised he'll try to train me more. We can cut spending. We can collect more revenues. We can use our savings accounts. Or we can shift responsibilities. I'm going to expand a little bit on those. We can cut spending, and we can cut spending in a variety of ways. We can cut spending in targeted cuts, or we could cut spending through across-the-board cuts. And we're going to have a lot of discussion of that, apparently, during the legislative session this year. If there's a 10% cut in the budget, that might be about roughly $600 million. Notice that um, some things are much harder to cut than others, as Gunnar suggested. It's much harder to um, cut back on the, uh, your debt service, which is your um, loan repayments, uh, in a technical term that's called a default. And you can ask Argentina about that, whether that's a good idea. Um, for example, you can collect more revenues. And there's a lot of discussion, it's gone on for decades in Alaska, about uh, collection of new revenues. There's a variety of ways to do it. I'm going to briefly sketch them. The state could uh, impose an, a, a, a broad-based tax. 
Alaska is the only state in the union that has no form uh, of any kind of uh, a broad-based general sales tax and no form of, of um, individual income tax of any kind. Uh, all states have at least one, some form of at least one, and of course a number of states have both. People have talked about raising on the order of $500 million perhaps from an income tax or a sales tax. Notice that the deficit this year is about $3.4 uh, billion, so that's a useful way. I want to say one other thing because I keep getting asked about it. People often excitedly ask me about marijuana taxes. <laughs> I'm not an expert in this area. But I will tell you that the most pro-marijuana group I'm aware of has suggested in a few years the state might collect $20 million a year in um, uh, marijuana tax revenues. That would imply that each Alaskan adult would have to smoke more than 150 times more marijuana a year than the most pro-marijuana group thinks is going to occur. <laughs> um, I'd suggest that's unlikely. Um, so in terms of to, to fill, to, to, if, to, if you're going to imagine we're going to make all the deficit up by marijuana tax revenues alone. Okay, so, and obviously people have, have also talked about the uh, use of permanent fund uh, 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 earnings in the budget as well. This is a highly controversial subject. Um, that's in the category of state using savings accounts. I mean, or collecting more revenues from using the, the, the earnings. I want to distinguish clearly between the permanent fund earnings on one side and the permanent fund principal on the other. They're legally very distinct items. Collecting more revenues might be the, the, the decision of the legislature to use some permanent fund earnings in the budget, which it could in a year, it could do it this month, as a legal matter. Using savings accounts is more in the category of, on the other hand, uh, spending the constitutional budget reserve, the statutory budget reserve, uh, and then perhaps spending the permanent fund principal, which of course would take a constitutional amendment and a vote of the people to make that happen. And then finally, there's shifting responsibilities also known as getting somebody else to pay for it. Um, well, one way of doing that, and probably the most prominent way that's been discussed in Alaska is a way that Gunnar has suggested, which is getting local governments to uh, take on some of the responsibilities the state does now. For example, if, the, if we're in the category of talking about constitutional amendments, the state, there's a constitutional amendment now in the last constitution, not a constitutional amendment, there's a constitutional provision in the last constitution which says the, the legislature of the state of Alaska provide for a school system for the children of the state of Alaska. If, say, that uh, was, uh, provision was eliminated they could, or rewritten and amended to say, local governments in Alaska <laughs> shall, uh, shall provide for uh, the um, uh, education for the uh, children in, in, those, uh, in those local uh, communities, that would obviously be a big change. That's one example of shifting responsibilities. I want to stress two numbers that Gunnar gave before, because they're very important in terms of scale of the problem, before we go through some of the questions. The $3.4 billion deficit this current fiscal year is more than $4,500 per Alaskan. And I want people to think about that carefully in terms of what that means. And when I say per Alaskan, I don't mean per working Alaskan. I mean per every man, woman, and child in the state. Now, I'm going to ask a series of questions. Gunnar's got numbers, I got questions. How much government do Alaskans want to have if they have to pay for most of it? I think that's a fundamental question because ever since way back when I had brown hair, when I first went to work for the Alaska legislature in 1981, that's been a prominent question because that was the time that the state of Alaska started getting the really big oil money and the time that the individual income tax, which Alaska had between 1949 and 1980, got repealed just the year before I started to work for the legislature. And the, uh, the year before, the permanent fund dividend was first paid in 1982 uh, on a bill which um, I was the, the legislative assistant who worked the most on. Um, so, and since then, Alaskans, there's been a big change, and of course we've relied, had a much bigger government than we had back in the, the 50s and 60s when I was a small boy here in Alaska, and it's been paid for since the oil boom by the oil industry. Taxes and royalty on, on the oil industry, largely. So people need to think about how much government the state wants to have, and the people of Alaska want to have if they have to pay for most of it, which is where we're going now. Next question I want to ask is, what is the permanent fund for? And I say this as someone who had a tiny role in the creation of the permanent fund, 
and a much, much, more, much larger role in the creation of a very different institution, which is commonly confused with, the, per, the permanent fund dividend. I was, back when I was 22 years old, one of the tens of thousands of Alaskans who voted for the Constitutional Amendment in 1876 that established the permanent fund. That's my role in creating the permanent fund. Um, unfortunately, as a legislative staff member pointed out to me today, Cliff, you're one of the last ones left. <laughs> and I said, well, thanks a lot, dude. Um, but it's true that I think if it was statistically analyzed, most of the people who voted back in the 1976 election um, are either a dead or uh, no longer residents. But that's an important question, and I've also written about this in um, four chapters in academic books that I've authored or co-authored on the permanent fund dividend. I've looked into this question. Before you get too excited about the amazing success of my career as a writer, um, I will point out that I made the exact same amount of money writing those chapters for those academic books as I made from modeling and stand-up comedy combined. It's a round number. Gentlemen, don't brag about it. It's a round number. But I looked very carefully at these questions, and I researched this, and I will tell you that there's not a clear historical or legal answer, or either historically binding or historically clear or legally binding answer, as to that question of what the permanent fund is for. And it's a question that every Alaskan and every generation of Alaskans have got to decide for themselves. So, the next question I want to ask is a really personal one. And it's, I want to say it very carefully. It's, how long do you intend to live in Alaska? And I want to stress this is not the objective question, which you often hear when people get up and talk at legislative hearings or at local, go local government uh, assembly tables, they say, I'm a lifelong Alaskan. I'm an Alaskan by choice. I don't mean that, how long you have lived in Alaska. That's an objective question. I'm talking about the personal subjective question of how long you intend to live in Alaska. Because although for some people, not for everybody, but for some people, I think the calculus is a lot different. If you go to someone and say, here we are in January 2015, I'd like you to sacrifice by paying more taxes to the state. That would be way more because you pay very little now. Or a reduction in your permanent fund dividend or a reduction in the state budget to make Alaska a better place in 2020. Because I will suggest to you that people who think they will be thousands of miles or hundreds of miles away from Alaska in 2020 are a lot less likely to be interested in that sacrifice for the future than people who think that they will still be here. Not everybody's like that, it's gonna put it out. Hey, Cliff, a lot of people are altruists, and I think he's right, but a lot of people aren't. So I think that's an important question that drives a lot of people's individual decisions about this. Next question is, what do you think the alternatives are? The best way to put this is in a specific way specific to this local area. Let's go to 2020 again, flash forward five years. And imagine you're, an apparent, you're a parent of three school-aged children living here in Juneau. And so a legislator comes up to you and says, you need to support me in my effort to put um, in a graduated income tax on the people of Alaska, or your son will have 63 kids in his second grade class next year. And you might have a certain reaction to that. Probably you'd have to, might say, grudgingly, yes, even if you thought if it was a graduated income tax, you might pay more than some people, or less. But you might have a different reaction. Imagine, on the other hand, in that same conversation in January of 2020, someone comes to you and says, got the same facts, you got the same three kids. The choice is having your son in that, that, that classroom of a six, uh, second grade classroom of 63 kids, or we're going to kill the final funding, that last bit of money left for this to sit in the dam on the budget. Those are the choices. If you see the choices that way, your answer might be a little different in how you think about the advisability or desirability of that income tax. So what you think the alternatives are, what political consultants might call framing, is a very Im important um, determinant uh, and driver of what, the way, way you're going to think about um, what makes sense. And kind of talking this, so I'll talk about this very briefly. The alternatives change over time. Um, Alaska has some options now. They, you might think, I've described them earlier as lousy. But if we blow through the reserves, and in five years the options will be a lot lousier. So they don't get better. Um, absent some giant, incredible uh, turnaround um, in um, the oil market. And I will tell you that a lot of people, and of course, you know, uh, I've made exactly zero money betting in the oil markets, but I've read a few things, Gunner's read more, 
you know, there's people talk about it, you know, even at a, a lower band of oil prices maybe, and, and it's almost maybe safer to bet on the low side of that band or even lower than Gunnar suggested than on the high side for any uh, protracted period of time. If pain is coming, who should bear the pain? This is not a, usually the way a legislator would, would talk. That's, you can see that's why you know, I'm not on the ballot. But I think that's an important question to ask and an important thing to realize that different kinds of policies will impose pain in different ways on different people. For example, as I told some legislative staff members today, and they recognize this quickly, I've lived in Alaska all my life, and for decades people have sort of suggested, hey, Cliff, if the state needs 500 million, to pick a number that I threw out earlier, if you want to raise 500 million, it's just the same, it doesn't make a difference whether you raise it by having an income tax, like the one Alaska repealed back in 1980, or if you just reduce permanent fund dividends by that amount. That's not true at all. There'll be very big differences on the effects of individual people, particularly if it was a, a graduated or progressive income tax, like that one that Alaska had that was repealed back in 1980. The same is also true with the difference between a sales tax and the reduction of permanent fund dividends in that amount. That's important things for Alaskans to think about. There are big distributional differences in different ways the budget gets cut, or that changes get made in the taxes, or the use of a permanent fund income, and they have different effects on different people. And it's an, people should think about who should bear the pain. As I told some of the staff members today, often you talk about winners and losers in politics. Maybe there's a question of relative losers, who's the biggest losers and who are the, the, the smaller losers. But there will be a ranking somewhat, and people should think about um, how we should line that list up. And relatedly, by what principle or principles should the pain be allocated? And Gunnar says, I need to keep this part pretty short, because otherwise I sound like an egghead like him. So this is a way that I will say it, which is, there's an ancient Greek um, who said more than 2,000 years ago, the strong will do what they can, and the weak will suffer what they must. And that's one principle by which Alaska could make decisions um, over the coming years as a way of allocating the pain or the relative losses among the population. You might either A, like that principle or statement, or B, think it's just the way of the world and there's no use fighting it. Or you might think of other principle or principles by which the pain should be allocated. But what I'm saying, ladies and gentlemen, tonight is now's the time to start thinking about those kind of things. Jeremy. Thanks, Cliff. So again, if you have any questions in our audience, please queue up at the microphone. We're available for them. Uh, thank you. Is this on now? Uh, thanks very much, uh, Gunter and uh, Cliff. Uh, just a simple question. Uh, over the last 30 years, we've been through this maybe three times. Uh, Sheffield administration, I believe Knowles and maybe Murkowski all had the same problem um, and the sky was falling each time and um, why is this time different from all other times? It's a great question. Um, in <laughs> First of all, what he says is absolutely true. We've been uh, in several times in the past, we've been in situations where people like me uh, and, and politicians, like our current po uh, politicians, perceived a problem, uh, a, a sort of unsolvable deficit problem, uh, sort of in exactly the same terms that we're, that we're using uh, today, and then the problem disappeared. And, and basically, uh, the reason the problem disappeared, uh, most re the, the, you know, the basic reason was oil prices just rose phenomenally. Oil prices went up from $20 a barrel to $100 a barrel, okay? And um, that, that just completely, we thought we're running out of money and then the, you know, they, the value of our oil was five times as high and we were no longer running out of money, we were rolling in money. Uh, and so it is possible that oil prices will go five times as high from $50 to 
and instead of running out of money, we'll be rolling in money again. It's possible. But <laughs> the question is, uh, so we have been very lucky, and the question is, can, is being lucky a strategy? Will we be lucky this time? Um, I think the question could also be summarized as, dude, um, folks like you have predicted nine of the last two recessions. You know, and then there's, there's something to that. But there are, in addition to sort of not counting on your luck too much, there's some, also some different objective factors. Oil production has continued to fall. We got less oil to sell or tax than we did before as compared to some of these earlier times. Um, costs, production costs have risen. Um, that, as Gunnar's pointed out, the effect of that. Um, in addition, um, the population's gone up, although it's fallen a little bit in the last, uh, uh, last year, but it's certainly way up from some of these, uh, it's, it's up from some of those earlier times. And then, I guess more subjectively, um, over the decades, expectations have continued to rise. It's sort of harder. We're getting farther and farther from the days when Alaskans actually paid the freight, carried the, the, the and uh, uh, paid the freight for the government that they that they have. And so it's harder from a psychological standpoint for people to address um, uh, this adjustment, which is clearly going to come in the sense that the way that the the Prudhoe Bay curve works, that the uh, oil production has fallen. Uh, for uh, almost entirely every year for 25 years. And as now, as Gunnar pointed out, the pipeline is only about a quarter as full as it was in the late 80s. Humans are notoriously bad at risk evaluation. Who is helping us to evaluate the probabilities associated with the various scenarios? <laughs> or did we just throw up our hands and say nobody has any idea what the price of oil and therefore the revenues is going to be? How do we help ourselves? Who's doing the modeling or some mm. other kinds of graphic presentation in addition to what you've given us to help us in our notoriously bad risk evaluation ability? Uh, first of all, I think this is something that um, economists at the Department of Revenue are very aware of, that um, you know, these sort of just one line and say that's the official uh, projection is not is not good enough for the kind of decisions we face, and we need we need better uh, you know, we need better information to help us understand, you know, what is the possibility of these different uh, scenarios. And there are techniques to do that to sort of to uh, give people a better idea of, you know, sort of what's the risk associated with different options. Um, and uh, part of it is just, um, and I've talked with them a lot, those, uh, those folks, they're smart folks. Part of it is that um, that's more complicated. You know, you, if you go to the legislature or to the average Alaskan and, and they, say, you, they want to say, well, how much money are we going to have? If you say, well, you know, you might have a lot or you might have very little and here's the pretty, you know, they say, just give me a number. So there's sort of, the, the truth is we, we need to make difficult decisions based on things that are fundamentally uncertain and sort of, and, and yet people psychologically, again, we go to the human psychology, don't like to deal with that. And so they, they say, keep it simple. And so, but I think that clearly we need to, we need to invest everything we can into, into narrowing our uncertainty so that we're, so that we are, are um, you know, realistically understanding our options. You know, it's like you go to the doctor and you say, doctor says, we, you've got a condition, this could be could be serious, you know. So, you know, uh, well, you know, you try to narrow your narrow your uncertainty with as much information as you can, but you're still stuck with a difficult choice. We could do better at this, and and I, um, we <laughs> yeah, we could do better. Did you follow? Nope. Looks like we've got time for about one more question. Yes. If we're looking just at economics, it's one thing. But being a Alaskan person by birth, I think it's just a wonderful opportunity to look at things that we can do. And one of the things you can look at is prison reform, because that costs us a lot of money. We can also look at native corporations who own the, a lot of the resources here and think of way, ways of managing our resources. You know, I think. This downturn is a wonderful opportunity. We can build bridges to the indigenous people who are 
part of the land ownership and who pay the highest in revenue in the outlying areas. So if we have a think tank going, we could make some changes. And, and I'm concerned about prison reform and also resource management. And these are the people who are going to stay here and make their home here. Yes, sir? Uh, I'm, I'm the former prosecutor at this table, and Gunnar um, knows fish uh, a lot better than I do. I'll let him take the, the, the resource part. On the prison reform part, it is no doubt, it is, no, there's no question that it's much cheaper uh, to keep people in less restrictive um, environments than prison. The prison is by far the most expensive. Uh, prison is more expensive than Harvard or Yale, um, you know, in, in, on a per day or per month or per year basis. So you need to, um, it, the state of Alaska would be, whether or not there was a fiscal problem or not, would be money ahead if it could figure out ways to get people more into substance abuse treatment as opposed to prison, if that is consistent with public safety and other goals you know, of the correctional system. And I, there had been a lot of that, uh, movement uh, I'm aware of toward uh, monitoring with uh, uh, electronic bracelets or uh, a whole bunch of uh, uh, technological surveillance and also re uh, very stricter probation uh, in parole where you have more visits to the home as alternatives to incarceration that make sense. Because keeping someone in prison or jail is very costly and as we, uh, the whole theme of tonight is states got less money than they used to have. Thank you. We've uh, just about run out of time for this forum at 360. We've been speaking with economist Gunnar Knapp of ICER and Alaska Common Ground Chairman Cliff Grow. To watch this and other programs produced by 360 North, visit us on the web at 360north.org. Thanks for joining us. For Forum at 360 comes from JRE Juno Real Estate, LG Rayfeld Mertz LLC, Alaska Airlines, Fjord Flying Service, and Joe and Darla Buck. <laughs>